Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's good to be here with you at Advent Hope in Atlanta. I was part of Advent Hope and Mama Linda. It's a different group, but for eight years, so it's, it reminds me a little bit of that, at least saying good morning, Advent Hope, happy Sabbath. All right, well, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and we'll get into our message. Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the privilege we have of worshiping you, and I just pray right now that in a very special way you would come into our presence and that you would be with me. Just, I just pray that you would speak through me, that I would simply be an instrument, and that Jesus would be lifted up, and that our hearts and minds would be placed upon heavenly things. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message for this morning is entitled, Sound Asleep. Are you sleeping, or are you wide awake? Be careful how you answer that question. I'm going to start by reading a statement from Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, by Ellen White. And she says, When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation, and it becomes an abiding influence. Don't you think that the third angel's message should become an abiding influence? We need to be hearing the third angel's message preached with power. That is the message for our time. That is the message that God has given to us as a people. And the message should be preached in such a way that power attends its proclamation. Now is not the time to be putting the trumpet down. We're getting closer to the end of the world. And as we get closer to the coming of Jesus, we as God's people need to wake up and to give the message in a way that will properly warn the world and the church of the soon coming of Jesus. So I'm here to tell you this morning that this is not a message that will put you back to sleep, hopefully. Hopefully this will be a message under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that is going to bring an awakening to the people of God. So when the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation and it becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power or it will accomplish nothing. Now, Ellen White does something very interesting here. She connects the third angel's message to the parable of the ten virgins, which was our scripture reading this morning. And here she says... I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. Now, if Ellen White says she was often referred to this parable, do you think this parable is important? Absolutely. And so I think that as we look at this parable again today, this parable is a message for our time. And she continues, this parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. The servant of the Lord says that the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the bridegroom, is present truth till the very close of time. Now, present truth is truth that is especially relevant for the time that we are living in, right? And so, when we look at this parable, we are studying an aspect of truth that is especially applicable to the time that we are living in. She calls it present truth, and she defines present truth in early writings as messages that connect to the sanctuary, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. Now, this message of the parable of the bridegroom is really a message that, as we studied about this morning, is a message that comes from Jesus to his sleeping church from the most holy place. And that's one of the reasons why it's present truth for our time. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Brother Norman, I'm not sleeping. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. I'm looking forward to him coming back. And I hope that it's going to be sometime soon. And that's good. Praise the Lord if that is your experience. 
And we're going to get into this parable and we're going to see that in God's church there are five wise and five foolish versions and we hope that we're part of the wise versions and we're going to see what the difference is. But let me paint a scenario for you just to get your mind thinking and the wheels turning as to your readiness for the coming of Jesus. This is not meant to scare you. This is just sort of a reality check of where are you in your life right now. You know, we know of statements that talk about an overwhelming surprise. I'm going to read some of those and how the final movements are going to be rapid ones. Let me just paint a scenario for you and, and allow your imagination to think about what you would react like if this really happened. Let's just say on Tuesday morning, a nuclear bomb, God forbid, went off in one of the large cities of the United States. The United States was thrown into utter upheaval, chaos, anarchy, rioting, all sorts of horrible things that start happening. And, the, and, and I'm just painting, I'm not saying this is how it's going to happen, I'm just putting a hypothetical out there. And people say, this is terrible, these are judgments that God is pouring on our country. We need to get back to God. Our country has been wandering away from the straight truths of God's word, and we're allowing homosexuality to come in and all sorts of other things into our country, and God is pouring out his judgments, and it's time for us as a country to get back to God. We need to be serious about following God, and this nuclear bomb that went off is showing that God is displeased with our nation. We need to come back to God, and we need to have a day of worship for God on Sunday every week where everyone goes to church. Are you ready for that? How are you living your life right now? If that were to happen, and all of a sudden, the leaders of the nation, the leaders of the churches, people on the talk radio shows, everywhere on the newspapers are saying, get back to God, get back to God. We need to demand our legislators to enforce legislation that will get people into the churches so that we can gain God's approval again. We need to have a day of rest on a day, on the first day of the week, a Sunday law. What would, how would you feel? Are you ready for that in your life right now? Because as Seventh-day Adventists, if we saw that scenario start to play out, we would say, wow, Jesus is just around the corner. He's coming. It's game over for this world. This is the end. That's it. That's what we've been looking for. Now, what would you react like? Would it, would it be like, wow, this really is it. I guess God's people have really gotten to themselves to a point where they're ready for Jesus to come. Jesus is going to come back for his waiting church now, and I am so excited that Jesus is going to come. Or would it be like, oh, wait a minute, wait. That's not in my five-year plan. I still have a mortgage to pay off. I still need my kids to get through school. Or I wanted to get married first. Or I wanted to have this event or that event or these accomplishments in my life. And what am I going to do about my house and my job? And what am I going to tell them my employers? What are they going to think of me? What would your initial gut reaction be to such a scenario? Because the parable of the bridegroom foretells of an event that will come, that will wake up God's sleeping church in the last days. And at that time, when God's church wakes up from its sound asleep state, because we are all sleeping, all ten virgins are sleeping, it will be revealed at that time which people in the church have been making preparations for the coming of Jesus and which have not. And I simply give that hypothetical scenario to allow your mind to start thinking, would you be excited about the soon return of Jesus, or would it be a scary inconvenience to you? Because if you're excited about the coming of Jesus, and I'm not talking about making a profession with our lips as we come to church, and we say, oh yeah, I want Jesus to come. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm looking forward to Jesus coming. We can all put on a good front when we come to church. But we know deep down inside our heart of hearts what our reaction would really be like if we saw such a scenario play out. Would it be like, praise the Lord, Jesus is coming? Or would it be like, oh no, I'm not ready yet? 
Because a day is coming when this world that's just been floating along and a church that's been sleeping along with a floating world, something is going to happen to wake the church up and to wake the world up. And Satan is going to gather all of his forces to get all the world to wonder after the beast. And God is going to have his church that is going to be prepared to stand, but he will have those in his church standing who have been faithful to him now when the rest of the world is sleeping and when the church is sleeping. Now is the time of preparation. Prophets and Kings 6.26, Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And this preparation they should make by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. So there is going to be an overwhelming surprise that hits the world. We need to be studying the word and striving to conform our lives to its precepts. That doesn't mean that we just float along with how the world lives. We are striving to conform to the way of scripture. The tremendous issues of eternity demand of us something besides an imaginary religion, a religion of words and forms where truth is kept in the outer court. You know, so many of God's people today simply have an imaginary religion. Our religion consists of showing up to church, and hey, that's good that you come to church because God can reach you at church. He can speak to you through his spirit. But there's a lot more to following God than coming to church once a week. And it's far past time for God's people to be having an imaginary religion where we're leaving the truth on the outer court of our lives, where we're leaving Jesus on the outside. We haven't let Jesus come in, and so we just go through the forms, we go through the customs, and we show up having an imaginary religion where we really don't know Jesus. God calls for a revival and reformation. That's Prophets and Kings 6.26. Similar statement, Testimonies, Volume 8, page 28. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth, should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Here you see two statements that an overwhelming surprise is coming. And those of us who know the truth should be preparing for that time. And the question is, how are you living your life today? Are you preparing your life? Are you living your life preparing to meet Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who's going to come out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to come for his waiting church? Or have you morphed into the way of the world so that you're living your life as if life is business as usual and time will just keep going and going and maybe one of these days Jesus will come? You know, that's the great struggle for Adventists today. Because we've heard the message that Jesus is coming soon for so long, we start to tune out. Oh, I've heard this before. Yeah, my parents said that Jesus was coming soon. Yeah, my grandparents said that Jesus was coming soon. I even had great-grandparents that were preaching that Jesus was coming soon. And I don't really see any clear, credible evidence that's, that it's going to be any time in the next year or two. So I'll just kind of keep doing what I'm doing. That's why the church is sleeping. Because even those who are among the wise virgins that we're going to talk about, that will be ready for that surprise to hit, if that hypothetical scenario actually happened this week, every single one of us in this room would be shocked out of our minds. I would be. I'm expecting to show up at work on Monday morning, and Tuesday morning, and Wednesday morning, and doing my job you know, op occupying until Jesus comes. I'm not expecting for the final events to actually kick in this week. Now, I believe that Jesus is coming. I'm just not really expecting it to happen this week. And if it really were to happen this week, the whole church would be shocked out of their minds. And the question is, are you ready for such an event to take place? Because one of these days, the final events are really going to kick in next week when the church wasn't ready for it. 
when the church was sound asleep. And so Jesus has given us a parable, not through one of the apostles. This is in the words of Jesus. And it's present truth for our time because it describes the church of God just before Jesus comes back. And the reality is that in the church of God, it's going to be an overwhelming surprise, and yet we have been instructed and warned that we should be preparing for that time. That that day should not overtake us as a thief. That we're not the children of darkness, we're the children of light. We should recognize the signs of the times around us. We should have a sense of urgency to the nearness of the coming of Jesus. And that takes us to our parable, Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now the context of Matthew 25 is pretty straightforward. Matthew 24 is where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And they thought that the end of the world would, would, would be when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. And so Jesus mixes the signs of the destruction of Jerusalem with the signs of his coming at the end of the world. And he gives all of these signs and then he gives a parable of a wise and a foolish servant at the end of Matthew 24. And then in chapter 25, he gives a parable to describe what God's church will be like just before Jesus comes. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now the very fact that the virgins are going to meet the bridegroom, the virgins, a, wor a woman that is a virgin is a pure woman, and a woman in the Bible represents a church. This is a pure church going forth to meet the bridegroom who is Jesus. In other words, this is a church that is expecting Jesus to come. This is an Adventist church. Because Adventists believe in the coming of Jesus. Now, what is it about this church? It's a pure church. And they took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. What is the lamp? We know this, Psalms 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto me, my feet and a light unto my path. This is the church that is looking for the coming of Jesus that has the truths of the word of God. This is a Bible-believing church that is expecting for Jesus to come in the clouds of heaven, and they're going forth to meet Jesus. So here you have a pure church. That is a Bible-believing church that is going forth to meet Jesus. And if all you read is verse 1, you are saying, wow, this is the church that is ready for Jesus to come. They have the truths of the Bible, and they're expecting Jesus to come. They're going forth to meet him. I want to be part of that church. And I do. This is a church that is theologically pure, and they expect Jesus to come in the clouds of heaven. <clears throat> now let me say this. Here you have a church that understands the truths of the word of God. It is a pure church. Ten virgins. They are theologically pure. They have the truths of the word of God. They believe what the Bible says. So, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I must be a wise virgin because I still believe what the Bible says about creation. No, that's not what the parable is teaching. What the Bible is teaching is that you can be wise or you can be foolish and believe the truths of Scripture, but just because you believe the truths of Scripture doesn't make you a wise virgin. All of the virgins had the lamps. They all had the Word of God. So let me say it to you straight. If you don't believe what the Bible says about creation, if you don't believe what the Bible says about the Sabbath or the second coming or of the sanctuary and that Jesus went into the most holy place in 1844 and other clear, straightforward teachings of Scripture that define God's last day church that is looking for the coming of Jesus, you're not even in the list of the ten virgins. You're not even relevant to the parable. 
This parable only applies to the people who believe in the truths of the Word of God, as set forth in Scripture. So if you believe in the Bible and you believe what it teaches, at least you're among the ten. Now, you want to be among the five wise, but you want to at least be considered by Jesus. If you don't believe what the Bible says, you're not even being considered, okay? So God's last day church, it's a truth-filled church, a Bible-believing church that, can, that the truth that it believes is contained within the boundaries of the lamp, the Word of God, that shines forth as a light and gives us light as we walk forward. So this is God's last day church. And then verse 2 says, And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. You know, from a human standpoint, it's almost incredible to believe, it's hard to believe, that a truth-filled church that believes in the coming of Jesus, that only five would be wise and the other five would be foolish. How could it be that if you believe in the coming of Jesus, you could get off track, especially when you have the truths of the Word of God, which is shining as a light to give you direction for the way you should walk. And yet that is the reality of God's last day church. <clears throat> now we know why, they're, why the five are wise and the five are foolish. Let's talk about that. Verse 3. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, how do we show from the Bible what the oil represents? Go to Zechariah chapter 4. And in Zechariah chapter 4, Zechariah sees the seven candlesticks, or seven lamps, and there are two pipes coming from two olive trees that are feeding olive oil from the olive trees to these lamps. So there's one pipe from one olive tree, another pipe from another olive tree, and it's the olive oil from those olive trees that are giving the oil to the lamps so that the light can shine. And Zerubbabel says, I don't understand this, and here the word of the Lord says at the end of verse 6, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, the oil represents the spirit. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit that allows the lamps to shine forth as lights to the earth. And so what we see in this parable is that the five wise have the oil of the Holy Spirit, and the five foolish do not. Now here's one other contrast that can be drawn when you look at churches in the world today. It is true that there may be churches, maybe in the Adventist church, that they are so focused on the truths of the Word of God that they're leaving the oil of the Holy Spirit out. So you'll come to church and you'll hear a truth-filled sermon, but it's lacking the power of the Spirit. And by God's grace, we need to bring the Holy Spirit into the church when it's lacking. But, you know, Satan comes up with counterfeits, doesn't he? And he says, you know what? Your church is boring. It's dead. It lacks the spirit, and maybe it does. So here's what you need. You don't have oil. Let me give you oil. There's just one condition. Remember that church that has the lamp? People with lamps don't have oil, so don't take the lamp. And so he gives oil to churches, but the, God has given us the lamp so that we will have a boundary and a framework for which the Holy Spirit will be able to shine forth with light. But the Holy Spirit will only give power within the boundary and the framework of the truths of Scripture. But Satan says, no, see those people with the Bibles? They're just dead. They're not on fire for God. You need to be on fire for God. Let me give you oil. Let me give you Holy Spirit. You need to start moving and dancing and jumping like the world. And what happens is when you have oil with no lamp, everybody gets messy. We need the lamp and the oil together, and the oil is contained within the boundary of the lamp, the truths of Scripture. 
And so the five foolish have no oil, and the five wise do. Ellen White has a lot more to say about this parable, continuing in review in Herald August 19, 1890. She says, in the parable, the t ten virgins had lamps, but only five of them had the saving oil with which to keep their lamps burning. This represents the condition of the church. The wise and the foolish have their Bibles and are provided with all the means of grace, but many do not appreciate the fact that they must have the heavenly unction. They do not heed the invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Continuing, she says, The enemy has men in our ranks through whom, who, through whom he works, that the light which God has permitted to shine upon the heart and illuminate the chambers of the mind may be darkened. There are persons who have received the precious light of the righteousness of Christ, but they do not act upon it. They are foolish virgins. So here you have five are wise, five are foolish. The foolish do not receive the heavenly unction. They do not act upon receiving the righteousness of Christ. And she continues on and says, those who have despised the divine grace that is at their command that would have qualified them to be the inhabitants of heaven will be the foolish virgins. They had all the light, all the power, but they failed to obtain the oil of grace. They did not receive the truth in its sanctifying power. Here's what Ellen White is telling us, because the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Jesus says to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he clarifies that in verse 5. He says, except a man be born of water and of what? The Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. To have the Holy Spirit in your life means that you are born again. It means that you are converted. It means that you have a sanctified experience as you are growing in Jesus every day, that you are living a converted, surrendered life to Jesus Christ. You know, it's possible to know everything about the mechanism of conversion and not be converted. That's a foolish virgin. You can know all about Jesus. You can know all about sanctification. You can know the verse, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. But Christ isn't living in you. You can have all the knowledge of how the Holy Spirit can come into your heart and transform your life, and yet you're satisfied with the theory of truth, and yet you're living your life unconverted. Those are the foolish virgins. They know the truth. They have the truths of Scripture, but they're not letting Jesus come in. It's the Laodicean condition. And Ellen White says something very interesting on Christ's Object Lessons, page 411, because we say, yeah, I mean, I know the truth. I believe in 1844. I believe in sanctification. I believe in the investigative judgment. I believe that Jesus is my high priest. I believe that he will cleanse the sanctuary. And yet... You are not allowing the sanctuary of your soul temple to be cleansed of sin. When you get crossed at work, you're snapping and losing your temper like you're unconverted, because you are. And you're eating the things you know you shouldn't be eating, and you're gaining weight, and you're living unhealthy, and all these things, and you know what the truth is, but you're not letting Jesus be the Lord of your life. Notice what Ellen White says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 411. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted their old nature to be broken up. Do you see what Ellen White is saying here? She's saying the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They actually believe the truth. They have a regard for the truth. They've advocated the truth. These could be people that are preaching the truth, and God forbid that it should be me or any other preacher that you hear. Those could be foolish virgins. Just because someone, a minister, can get up and break down the 2300 days in the sanctuary message and talk to you about Jesus, that is not proof of his conversion. 
And so many times we lift up the messenger and say, wow, you're preaching the message in a way I've never heard before, and you don't realize that it's going to his head, and he's starting to think, man, I'm pretty good, aren't I? And you don't realize that they're walking around struggling with all these issues of pride and ego as well. Just because you can preach the truth and advocate the truth, that's a good start, but that doesn't mean that you have fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus. What we're talking about here is conversion. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Has the oil of the Holy Spirit come into your heart so that whenever your, your conscience is pricked about whatever issue it is in your life, whether it's diet, dress, music, entertainment, whatever you want to put out there on the table, you say, if the Holy Spirit's convicting me on this because I love Jesus and because he's the Lord of my life, I'm going to lay this on the altar. Those are the wise virgins. Allowing Jesus to come in so that he can not only be our Savior, but that he can be the Lord of our lives and that he can clean us up through the power of the oil of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's fascinating to me that when I read that statement, that the foolish virgins, they have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. They like to go to meetings where the truth is preached. And the question is, what are you like when you go home? You hear a message that points you to Jesus and of his soon coming and of how he is working to develop a people that will be cleansed of sin here on this earth, and you're like, amen, I believe it, and you go home, and the very thing that you're convicted on, you keep doing like Romans 7. That's the foolish virgins. And that's why this message will be present truth till the very close of time, because this is describing the warfare between Christ and Satan over his saints in his church, over the saints of God in the church, where God is trying to develop a group of people who will be ready for his coming. And Satan is working, on the other hand, to try to keep the church sound asleep and unconverted. And because we have waited so long for Jesus to come back, the whole church has morphed into this attitude of like, he'll come one of these days, and I hope he comes. The wise virgins really are hoping that Jesus will come, but they're not expecting it in the next week or two. And so nobody is really expecting it right away, so everybody is sleeping. And Satan is trying to get the entire sleeping church to be unconverted. And Jesus is speaking to his church today. And he is hoping and he's pleading with each one of you to put some oil in your lamp. That when you read the truths of Scripture and you have your lamp, And he commends you for having your lamp. That you will not just have your lamp and leave it as a theory in your mind, but that the truths of Scripture under the power of the Holy Spirit will transform your heart so that you will become a different person, that you will become like Jesus. You know, the best place to determine if you're converted is in your home. I mean, we can come to church and even go to board meeting or elders meeting, and unfortunately I've been to board meetings and elders meetings or whatever where there have been unconverted moments, and that's not good either. But you can put on a good front in front of the elders of the board or the church members at potluck and be all nice and happy and cheerful and, oh, yeah, I love Jesus. But you are who you are at home. Your real character comes out when you're around your family, when nobody else is around. Yeah, when the visitors come over, you're nice and fine. But when nobody is around, how do you relate to your spouse and how do you treat your kids? When they start to get under your skin, when they do that very thing that really annoys you, Do you respond the way Jesus Jesus would respond, showing that the oil of the Holy Spirit has come into your heart, demonstrating that you are a converted person, or are you habitually and consistently and continually giving unconverted responses around your family? That is evidence of where you are in your experience with God right now. And I don't know what it's like for you, 
I don't live with any of you. So I'm just putting that out there because I'm speaking to myself. What am I like when none of you are around, when none of you are watching? How do I treat my wife? How do I treat my children? Would they say of me, I pray by the grace of God that they would, but would they say of me, he's a converted man? Or would they say, you know, he's just putting on a nice front for you guys? Because we can all do a good job of faking it if we really try hard enough, for a little while at least. And yet God knows our hearts, and he wants all of our hearts. He wants us to receive the oil of his Holy Spirit so that we will be converted, so that we will have the power of the Holy Spirit transforming our hearts and transforming our lives. Now let's keep reading this parable. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So you do have a group of people in the church that even though amazingly so they are sleeping, they are converted... They have the power of the Holy Spirit, the converting oil in their lives. And this is a demonstration that there are people in God's church who are living, overcoming, converted lives. Despite the fact that some people may say it's not possible to overcome as Jesus overcame, Jesus says, if you overcome as I overcame, you will sit with me in my throne. And there are wise virgins who are in the church today. But here's the thing. We won't know who's converted until the crisis hits. So a a lot of people who believe the truth can look converted now, but only when the crisis hits will we really know. Continuing. While the bridegroom tarried, They all slumbered and slept. Even the wise slumbered and slept. Jesus went to receive the kingdom in 1844. And here we are in 2014, 170 years later, still saying, yes, Jesus is going to come out of the most holy place when the sanctuary is cleansed, and he is going to come the second time. And yet so many Seventh-day Adventists are like, I heard that one before. Why don't we talk about something more interesting now? Come on now. We're Seventh-day Adventists. Our very name says that we believe in the coming of Jesus. You know, Noah had to preach for 120 years that a flood would come. He probably had a credibility problem with the world. He had a big credibility problem with the world. But he kept preaching it until it happened. And you know what? By the grace of God, I am going to keep preaching that Jesus is coming until it happens. Because it's going to happen. And we don't need Seventh-day Adventists to grow weary of proclaiming the very message for which we were called into existence to proclaim. And look, if you don't want to preach the coming of Jesus, then maybe you shouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I'm not trying to be mean or hard, but that's our message. We are Seventh-day Adventists, believing in the Advent, the second Advent of Jesus. That is our message. Now, here's the thing. If you don't want Jesus to come right now, you go back to that hypothetical scenario, next week something major happens and final events take place and you're like, well, I really hope it doesn't happen next week because I still have some things to get done, that probably means you're not ready for Jesus to come. Because people who are ready for Jesus to come will want him to come. Let's keep reading here. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And notice verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And everybody woke up. Everybody was sleeping. And then at midnight, this is the midnight cry in the parable, at midnight a cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. A day is coming when it will become very clear that Jesus really is coming right now. Yeah, there's the final events. There will be the Sunday law and the close of probation and the time of trouble and the seven last plagues. But once those certain events kick in, we as Seventh-day Adventists know that Jesus really is coming. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And when those undeniable events start taking place that we have so long foretold would happen... Everybody in the church is going to wake up. 
the ten virgins are going to wake up. Now, there's still probably going to be scoffers on certain websites that are going to be saying, ho, ho, look, they're discussing Sunday legislation in Washington. I bet some Adventists are getting really riled up now. Don't believe what you re read on some of those websites. Now, what happens here is that the truth-believing church, the virgins, when they see the events kick in, they know the truths of the Bible. And they know that because these events are starting to take place, that Jesus really is coming. And so the sleeping, pure church wakes up. And then we will see who is wise and who is foolish. Let me read to you another statement. This is Christ's Object Lessons, page 412. And by the way, if you want to do some good reading, go again to um, Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, and then also read the last chapter in Christ's Object Lessons. Both of those have very helpful sections on this parable. Christ's Object Lessons, page 412. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. Now listen to this very carefully. So now, a sudden and unlooked-for calamity something that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. Notice, it is in a crisis that character is revealed. And so you can think in your own life right now, what happens when the little mini crises hit? Just about two weeks ago, I was in Orlando. Um, it was GYC, and we were going to fly back, and we get to the airport. We had a 7 p.m. flight, and then the flight gets delayed till 2 a.m., and here I have my two little daughters and my wife. So that's not so great, but at least we're going to get a flight back when people who are flying to Chicago get their flights canceled, or at least flying to Nashville. But then we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and then finally... The flight gets delayed to 3 in the morning, then 3.20 in the morning, and at 1.45 they're like, oh, sorry, it's canceled. Now, this is a minor trial in the big picture, right? But at the moment, it's like, oh, no, this is horrible. And there were people coming up to the airline ticket counter, and they're like, you guys did this on purpose so that you wouldn't have to pay for a hotel tonight. And there were people using bad language, and everyone was losing their tempers. And the question is, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you're in that situation, are you like everybody else? It's in a crisis that character is revealed. And that's a minor trial compared to what's going to hit the world. And the Lord gives us these little tests now to show where our character is at so that if we're losing our temper and we're slipping a little bit here and there, it's a wake up to us like, wow, I don't have the oil of grace in my heart so that I can have a peace that passes understanding when everyone around me is falling apart. I'm falling apart like everybody else. I need to have a, the oil of grace so that when these crises hit, I can trust in the Lord. Because when that final crisis hits, you can't do a, have a do-over. It's going to be a revelation of who is wise and who is foolish, who has been sustained by grace, who is converted, who has allowed Jesus to be the Lord of their lives, so that when the crisis hits, the minor things now and the major one then, we trust in the Lord and we allow him to sustain our lives. It is in a crisis that character is revealed, and a sudden and unlooked-for calamity is coming, something that will bring the soul face to face with death that will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. You know, it's easy to be a Christian when things are going well, when the money's coming in and the job's going great and the kids are doing well and everybody's nice to you and things are nice and it's just like, oh, the Lord is so good, his blessings are so great. But you realize that the Lord allows the, the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. That's not necessarily an evidence that God is especially blessing you. 
The question is, what is your character like when you hit a major bump in the road? That will tell you right now where you are in this parable. What is your like when the little crises hit every day? Those little crises, those little trials, and even the bigger trials. And look, there's some big trials that some of you may be going through right now. Loss of a job, loss of a family member through death, things like that. Those aren't minor little things to be passed over. It's like, oh, that's just a minor trial. No, those are trials. And it wouldn't be a trial if it wasn't hard. I mean, if you say, oh, yeah, I had a trial and that was easy, that's not a trial. A trial is something that tests your faith in God. And what are you like when that trial comes? Are you like the children of Israel where you say, oh, God, let us out here to die in the wilderness? Or, oh, we've just believed an Adventist message that Jesus will come, but he's not really coming. He's just out to get me. God's not really helping me. What are you really like in the trials of your faith? That is an evidence of where you are in this parable. And this, the, the message in this parable, at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The church will wake up, and at this part in the parable, the wise virgins with the oil in their lamps under the power of the Holy Spirit are going to go forth to the world to give the message as seen in Revelation 18, where an angel comes down from heaven having great power, and the earth is lightened with its glory. This is the latter reign of the loud cry, but only the wise virgins are going to give this message because they will have the oil of the Holy Spirit. And by the grace of God, I want to be one of those virgins that gives the loud cry. That is why we are here as Seventh-day Adventists. It's not here to just live the good life and to do well and be successful. Yes, we occupy till we come, but we are missionaries. We go out and we serve the Lord, and we are sharing the message to prepare the world for the soon coming of Jesus. And when that crisis comes, when the final events kick in, by the grace of God, under the power of the Holy Spirit, He wants to use us to be a demonstration of His character under the power of the Holy Spirit to the world. And at that point, with great joy and excitement, we will be proclaiming, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. You know, in Titus chapter 2, Paul describes the coming of Jesus as the blessed hope. You know what the problem is for the foolish virgins and for many Seventh-day Adventists? It's not really the blessed hope, it's the scary hope. You know how many Seventh-day Adventists are scared of the coming of Jesus? And you know why they're scared? It's because they don't have the oil. It's because they're not converted. Because Jesus says, I'm standing at the door knocking, let me come in. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. This is talking about full and complete surrender. Listen, if you are surrendered to Jesus, if he is the Lord of your life, you are looking forward to him coming in the clouds of heaven. But if this world is what you're living for, you can have a profession of being ready for Jesus to come. You can enjoy hearing messages that say, yeah, we should be Seventh-day Adventists, and we should believe in the Sabbath and the Second Coming and the Sanctuary. Yes, I believe all those things because I know that's the truth. But if you're not surrendered to Jesus, in your heart of hearts you're going to say, boy, that would be not so good if there was the final events kicking in next week because I'm not so sure I'm ready for Jesus to come. And we can talk about assurance of salvation and being covered with the righteousness of Christ, but at the end of the day, if you really want to talk about assurance, examine your own heart and ask yourself, do I really want Jesus to come right now? Or do I want to live another 20, 30, 40, 50 years on this world, see my kids grow up, develop a nice retirement savings account, live the good life, go on lots of vacations, and then after I've enjoyed all the things of this world, then, Jesus, you can come. Really? We are Seventh-day Adventists. We are not only to be proclaiming the coming of Jesus, 
We are to be looking for that blessed hope with great longing, with great hope, with great desire. If you've been in a long-distance relationship with someone special, I was for a year and a half, you look forward to the times that you are together. The problem with so many Seventh-day Adventists, there are many Seventh-day Adventists that want to have a permanent, long-distance relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is saying, that's not what I'm looking for. I want to come in. I want to have a relationship with you where I'm not only your Savior, but I am your Lord. That is the message for Adventism today. We can get into all these complicated time charts and people, as they grow weary and waiting for Jesus to come, come up with all sorts of weird and interesting theories and say, oh, if you just believe in the 2520, then you'll receive the seal of God. And all sorts of other foolishness that has nothing to do with conversion. And at the end of the day, God is working through Jesus in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to develop a group of people who will have the oil of the Holy Spirit in their lives so that when crises hit in our lives, when trials come, we will demonstrate the character of Jesus first in our homes, then in our surrounding work environment, and then to the onlooking world. And if you're not having that experience in your home, now's the time to get it in your home. And then take it to your work, and then take it to the world. Look, you, you can say, oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to give the loud cry with power when that time comes, and yet you're not even demonstrating the character of Jesus to your family. Now's the time to allow Jesus to come in. So as we close, I hope by the grace of God, that the message has been clear. And that we have an understanding that yes, Jesus could be coming very soon. And we have to ask ourselves the question, do I want Jesus to come? Will I be happy and excited, or will it be a major scare and inconvenience to my life? Listen, I, it would go without saying that there are some foolish virgins sitting in this congregation today. There would have to be. If you look at God's church according to the parable, there's no way that every single one of us in here would be wise. There may be some foolish virgins sitting in here today who you've advocated the truth, you have a regard for the truth, but you realize that you're not surrendering your life to Jesus. And Jesus, as he is in the message to the Laodicean church, is standing at the door of your heart right now knocking. And he's saying, let me come in. And when I come in, I'll, I'll bring that oil with me. And you'll experience a peace that passes understanding that the world can't give you. That you'll have a joy and, a, and an experience with Jesus every day that will make you ready and longing and desirous for him to come. That's what Jesus wants to give to each one of you right now. And the attractions of this world, who's going to win, are the Falcons, oh, I guess they're out, are the Falcons going to win, or the Braves going to do anything? That's not going to matter anymore. Because we're living for Jesus. Or the latest shows from Hollywood, if we're living for God, that's not even going to be on the table for us. We're not going to be doing the things of the world. We're going to be out there advocating the truth, representing Jesus properly to the world. And people in the world will say, I want what you have. If it is your desire to enter into a deeper walk with Jesus, where you will have the oil of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to, to, I'm just going to make a, an appeal. We're going to have a short prayer and then we'll have our closing hymn. I, I would invite you to stand with me. This may not be for everyone, but you want to have Jesus in a way that you haven't been having him. That you will fall on the rock Christ Jesus and be broken. And there may be certain things in your life, in the area of diet, dress, entertainment, whatever it may be, that the Holy Spirit is convicting you right now, and you say, you know, Jesus, you died for me on the cross. You're an amazing Savior, and I want you to be the Lord of my life now. And there's things that I've been holding back. Lord, please forgive me, and I, I lay them on the altar. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the moving of your Holy Spirit. 
We thank you that you are such a loving God that you give us messages in Scripture for our time to help us understand our own hearts because you understand our hearts in a way that we can't even understand. And you love us so much that you want us to be prepared to stand in the judgment, that you want us to be ready when you come, that you want us to be among those who give the loud cry to warn a lost and dying world to come out of Babylon just before you come back. Lord, we pray for forgiveness for how we've been sleeping away, waiting for you to come. Help us to wake up. I pray that you would raise up messengers who would help to wake your sleeping church up to prepare them for the soon coming of Jesus. Because someone's going to give the, the cry that will wake the church up. I pray that each one of us here would allow you to work through us to, for that to be accomplished. And I pray that if there's something in our heart that we've been holding on to, maybe it's an article of clothing or a certain item of food or a certain entertainment that we, just that one last little thing that has kept us from spending time with you, but we just kind of hang on to it, that you would come into our lives and that we would surrender all on the altar and that we would experience a peace that passes understanding. So thank you, we praise you, and may you go with us throughout the rest of the Sabbath, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>